as I said when I first heard that, are we at the cathedral? <laughs> May today be a day of wonderful surprises. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Lord, by the stripes which wounded thee, from death's dread sting thy servants free, that we may live and sing to thee. Alleluia. Lord, in your resurrection power, break open the bonds of our hearts. Set us free from the stench of death and pour out upon us your great and glorious and majestic joy. Speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening, for it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. As I was reading the scriptures this week, I was astonished both at how much I knew that the disciples in this story did not know yet. And probably what that says to me about what I think I know but really don't. You see, what the disciples knew after the crucifixion was doubt, loss, grief, pain, anguish, sorrow, confusion. Everything that they had hoped for was dead in Jesus. He had been in the tomb. Remember, they, they wanted to anoint his body. There was no sense among any of them that he was ever going to come back to life at all. And then they presumed falsely that because he was dead in the tomb, he wasn't doing anything. That's what you think of when you think of death. <laughs> Activity's finished. It's over. Curtains. This is it. But 2 Peter tells us that after his death, he went and preached to the souls in prison, what we classically call the harrowing of hell. Listen to this by Denise Leverton. Down through the tomb's inward arch, he has shouldered out to gather them, dazed, the merciful dead, prophets, innocents, just his own age and those unnumbered others waiting here in an endless void he is ending now, stooping to tug at their hands to pull them from their sarcophagi, dazzled, Golgotha dust still streaked on the dried sweat of his body. No one had washed or anointed yet. All these he will swiftly lead to the paradise road. They are safe. That done, they must take, then must take place, that struggle. No human could preserve to picture living, dying, and descending, rescuing the just were lesser travails than this, to break through earth and stone of the faithless world back to a cold sepulcher, tear-stained, tear stifling shroud, to break from them back into breath, heartbeat, Walk the world again, days and weeks again. Wounds of his anguish opened, spirit streaming through every cell of flesh, so that if mortal sight could bear it, it would seem as if he was lit with light. But now, aching for home. You see, Mary thought it was over. She didn't know. That even in, even in death, Jesus was on a mission. What was Jesus doing? He was going after the forgotten, after the abandoned, after those for whom life was only a distant memory. Their sense of loss and confusion and doubt shows us how much they didn't know, but it also shows how much we don't know. We think we have the intellectual capacity to perceive and see things right. But this passage points us to actually the, the limitations of our own depth. Terry Eagleston, an Irishman, which you'll hear later when he quotes some of the things he does, puts it this way, an enlightened trust in the sovereignty of human reason can be every bit as magical as the exploits of Merlin, and a faith in our capacity for limitless self-improvement just as much a wide-eyed superstition as faith in leprechauns. 
we think we would know more than the early disciples. But the fact of the matter is, we're in the same boat. A part of what we're manifesting here, what we're talking about here, what we're trying to make visible here, is to pull back the curtain on an unseen miracle that we don't always notice. And because that's the case, our perceptions are shaped strictly by what we see. And we are not willing often enough to admit that somehow our perceptions are truncated to our experience. And when that is the case, inevitably it skews our understanding of God's activity in the world. Jonathan Martin puts it this way, the great secret that the resurrection shows us, literally humming through all of creation, is that death is not final. Death is not final. That's what they didn't know. It's a miracle, quite honestly, that they believed it all. But notice what Jesus does, and he keeps doing this. This is not just true for the disciples. Is that what Jesus continues to do is to arrange circumstances that are deeply individualistic, that call and speak to the very thing that's going on inside of our very personal heart. You know, we begin the most, with the most dangerous prayer. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid. Do you hear what you're saying? That means we can't hide. It, we, it means that we can't act somehow that God, <laughs> God, God's not noticing. We even placate ourselves with the complete myth that says, you know, what's going on in my life is so small, God doesn't care about that. He just needs to take care of things like world peace. Nothing could be further from the truth. And so, in a way that is so poignant, in particular to Mary Magdalene, who really is the hero in this story, Jesus appears to her and it is through her interaction with Jesus that the whole thrust of the story is visible right front. The point of the story is actually the physicality of the resurrected body of Jesus. He is, as N.T. Wright says, graspable. Can you believe that? Terry Eagleton again, Christian faith is not about moral uplift, political unity, aesthetic charm, nor does it start from some vagueness about our responsibility to the infinite. It starts with a crucified and resurrected body. That is the line of demarcation. That is the heartbeat of what it means to be a believing Christian. Either he came up out of the grave resurrected by the stripes that wounded the, the disciples could see it. Touch my hands and my side, he would later say to them. Or else there's some very ephemeral idea about, you know, perennials dying, come back again, things like that. That, I mean, I just want to say, so what? Because you see, the cycles of human nature, the cycles that are in created nature, do not get at the heart of what's happening in my life what's going on inside of me. Because you see, what's inside of me is a confusion of worlds, worlds inside of other worlds, all of my history playing itself out, reminding me, popping up in the absolutely most unexpected of ways, surprises that I don't always welcome, mind you, thoughts that invade my heart. I think I'm pretty, doing pretty well, and then I yell at the person in front of me in the, while I'm driving my car. I mean, right? In other words, what I don't know about me is a lot. And I've taken quite a bit of time at self-reflection. In other words, I need something bigger than the cycle of the seasons. I need someone who has literally conquered death. Who in so doing is committed to completely conquering the death in me. Otherwise, I'm just another poor sucker trying to be good. 
and not always succeeding. If that's what you want out of your religion, you're actually in the wrong place. We're not a bunch of suckers trying to be good. <laughs> actually, just the opposite. We're a bunch of redeemed sinners who are learning how to care about each other even in the midst of the obvious nature of our sin. We're reveling in a God who is so deep in forgiveness, so powerful in overcoming the grave that he literally pours life in us that we do not deserve. You see, that's the real twist in this story. The originality of God, who does not present us merely with a, as a wise teacher, a miracle worker, but a humble, fearless carpenter in whom the fullness of God is revealed. The Word made flesh, our flesh and blood. The Word expressed in the very kindness and mercy of God, even in the face of human anguish, our anguish, the very power of God against the forces of evil, including the evil that attacks you and me, the very wisdom of God speaking into our deepest human dilemmas at work in our life, even though we don't always see it or know it. <laughs> you see, if your belief in God is still based primarily on an experience that you feel or something as nebulous as that, inevitably it will come and go. You want to keep going back to that feeling that you had and live with a sense of loss that it's not there. What God does is something far more deep and powerful from that, than that. He cements in us his life-changing nature, and it is that nature that literally creates a change inside of us that sometimes we feel and sometimes we don't. But the fact of the matter is, is that it is always there. The great secret in the life of a Christian is that even though it doesn't look like it from the outside, death is not the end, even for the Christian, and that God is at work in them, literally sowing seeds of eternal life that they never deserve, but He's giving it to them anyway, inviting them in literally, finally, to glory, to that place where there is no pain, there is no grief, where God wipes away every tear from every eye. You see, today, we shout Alleluia, because we know that Jesus wins. Resurrection life has triumphed over death. Our anguish is not eternal. The grave has lost its finality. The sardonic laughter of hell has been silenced. Hell has been harrowed. The death, death is defeated. Sins are forgiven. We, oh God, thank you, will not get what we deserve. But we are gifted with the grace of eternity. So yes, Christ is risen, alleluia. It is a statement of great triumph, even in the midst of profound and often human sadness. It's actually a cry of defiance to say alleluia in this broken and sinful world where confusion and fear reigns is to say literally to the powers that control our universe, you do not have the last word. Jesus is risen from the dead and my destination is heaven. Let's go. And out of that begin to work with the kind of grace and measure that is only supernatural in the midst of a culture that is dying to sow seeds of light life. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. So in fact, this resurrection life is not a call to hide out. That's for the fearful. No, it's a call to step in, to say hallelujah even in the midst of political and social change, to say hallelujah even in the midst of the conundrums of human anguish, to be there is a steady place of solace because that's who God is for us. What will you do with this? Malcolm Geedy's poem on Easter. Do not fear the memory of sin. There is a light that heals and where it falls transfigures and redeems the darkest stains into translucent colors. 
Loose the veils, draw the curtain back, unbar the doors of that dreaded threshold where your spirit fails. The hopeless gate that holds in all the fears that haunt your shadowed city, fling it wide, open to the light that it finds and fears, through dark pathways where you run and hide, through all the alleys of your riddled heart that feel as pierced and open as his wounded side. Open that map to him, make a start. Down the dizzying spirals through the dark, his light will go before you. Let him chart and name and heal. Expose the hidden aches to him. The stinging fires and smoke that blind your judgment carry you away. The mark and muted gloom in which you cannot find the love you thought was once worth dying for. Call him to all that you cannot even call to mind. He will come and harrow hell. Now to your well-guarded fortress, let his love descend. The icy ego at your frozen core, can you hear his call? Will you respond? Will you even today allow the indignation against evil and the certainty of God's triumph to shout Alleluia through you, because Jesus wins even in the face of darkness. Will you allow the Alleluia to break forth joy inside of you as opposed to the humdrum boredom of a despairing life? Will you be willing to step in knowing that you, knowing that you are clothed with the armor of Christ and that he has defeated death? That's the call of Easter. Easter triumph, Easter joy. That's what we're invited to. If you want a boring life, you can have it. But it's not necessary. There is an adventure that awaits those who are willing to follow he who conquered death. And it is that power that allows us in the midst of all that we know to even today shout, Alleluia, Christ is risen. Amen.